Welcome back, champions, to the series of Ranking the Champions of Idol Champions, seat by seat. This time we're reaching the double digits as we keep on ascending. This seat really does have a little bit of everything. A fair amount of tanks, some healers, some DPS, and some decent supports. And you know how we do it around here. We start with the core champion of the seat and we work our way down alphabetically. That means this time we're beginning with Tyrrell. The neutral good, Furbolg Druid. He's versatile in a distant way similar to Makos from seat 9, and that his specialization choice is very early, only his second upgrade level, and depending on which of the two you choose will completely change his role in your party. The first choice is Moonbeam, which turns Tyrrell into a healer and support. Moonbeam itself increases the damage of all champions in your formation, reduced for each champion adjacent to Tyrrell. So, for maximum effect, you want him adjacent to as few champions as possible. Though, depending on your formation, this is countered a bit with his other ability, Druidic Healing, where he heals only adjacent champions. So if you want him healing multiple champions, you're working against his Moonbeam. A bit of an odd design. At the end of the day, Moonbeam is more important, so make sure you have him adjacent to as few champions as possible. His ultimate with this specialization is a simple Kamehameha, the second specialization choice is Wild Shape, where Tiro will go bear form and turns into a tank and support. With this specialization, he is in fact the objectively most durable tank in the entire game. He gains a few means of mitigation, but the largest comes from his ultimate, Shielding Bite, where he leaps out and cleaves enemies near a random enemy, giving himself a huge pool of temporary hit points that slowly decay over time scaling with how many enemies he hits or kills with the cleave. His support in Wild Shape comes in the form of Wild Inspiration, where he increases the damage of champions within two slots of him. He also gives a minor boost with Forces of Good, where for each enemy attacking him or each enrage stack, he increases the damage of good champions by 100% for each stack. He is a very useful tool in your kit for being a core champion and available for every patron, and I'd put him in a B+. He doesn't quite reach that A tier even while being one of the most tanky tanks, because his numbers are very, very low. He is outperformed by almost any support in terms of raw buffing power, but if you're in a rare position where you need tankiness over damage buffing, this is who you want. Second in line is Barrowin, the lawful good Dwarf Cleric. She serves as a healer and support, and while not tagged for it, she can serve as a pseudo-secondary tank. She casts the first level spell, Healing Word, for her healing roll, which will heal everyone in her slotted column for a decent amount every second, and also the tanks in the column in front of her by half of that amount. Linked to her healing is another first level spell, Shield of Faith, where after Barrowin lands an attack, her next healing word will instead grant temporary hit points which is then further increased by even temper, where any time a champion takes damage that is eligible to be healed by her, she attacks faster for 8.2 seconds. Now all of this healing and shielding is also tied in a way to her pseudo tanking and ultimate. First, through Divine Aid, where her max health is increased by 50% of the champion with the most health in her column and her overwhelm limit is increased to allow her to take a bit more of a hit to stand up with the tanks in the front line, and her ultimate applies another shield to all allies in her column, hence why you'd want her with your tanks, and reduces her attack cooldown even further by 2 seconds briefly. Now, all of her healing aside, her support comes from Blessed Hammer, where she increases the damage of champions adjacent to her, increased multiplicatively by 100% for every second differential between Barrowin's attack speed compared to the attack speed of those she's buffing. She fills her roles nicely, and while her buffing numbers are nothing crazy, she's better than average. I think she sits nicely in a B to high B ranking. Now we're on to Eliwick, the chaotic neutral gnome bard, and serves the roles of healing, support, and gold. Her entire kit requires you to pray to RN Jesus, as she draws a card from her deck of many things as she aspires to be a Magic the Gathering card-pulling YouTuber. <laughs> she will draw a new card every 100 areas she is present for, and depending on which one she draws throughout the adventure, it will affect how she buffs the party. 
We'll go over her base formation abilities first, then explain the cards linked to those abilities. First off is her support, Powerful Following, where she increases the damage of champions in the column behind her. This is linked to the Knight card, which she has a 25% chance to pull from the deck. While the Knight card is active, every 100 enemies you kill earns you a Knight stack, and you can earn a maximum of 25 stacks per time you pull the card. Each Knight stack equals a 10% increase to Powerful Following, stacking additively. For Gold Find, she gains Fortunate Soul, where she flat increases the Gold Find of the party. The card tied to this formation ability is the Gem card, which has a 25% chance of being pulled. This gains a stack for every 3 gems collected while the card is up. These stacks cap at 20 while the card is drawn, and 75% of the total gem stacks persist after the card is no longer active. For each gem stack you have, Fortunate Soul is increased by 5%, stacking additively. Her last formation ability, Greatest Song in the Multiverse, decreases the maximum health of enemies by 50%. The card tied to this ability is the Moon card, having a 25% chance of being pulled, and gains a stack for each boss loot sack earned while the card is active, capping at 20 stacks while the card is active, and maintaining only 50% of them when drawing a new card. For every 5 stacks, the enemy health debuff is applied again, stacking multiplicatively with itself. Now although she doesn't have another formation ability, there are two other cards she can pull. First is the Flames card, which has a 20% chance of being drawn, and you don't want that little bastard. You gain one stack when it's drawn, and all stacks will persist if you draw Flames again. For each stack, enemies move 100% faster and deal 100% more damage but only when the Flames card is active. She also has a 5% chance to draw the Fates card. This card is both good and bad. Firstly, it disables any existing stacks from other cards while it is active, but brings them back and increases them by 25% when the card is discarded. So if you intend to use her for gold find, just be sure the Fates card is not actively up when you do so. Her healing tag is very minor, coming from her ultimate where she summons six Feywild creatures to storm through the battlefield, dealing damage on their way. They gather near her for 15 seconds, increasing the effect of powerful following by 200% for the duration, and all adjacent champions to Eliwick are healed for 50% of their maximum health. After the 15 seconds is up, they storm off, dealing damage to all enemies again. Her specializations help you try to focus on a specific type of card, while increasing its effect. The first increases the chance to draw a Knight card by 10%, and reduces the chance to draw Moon and Gem by 5%, while increasing the effect of Knight stacks to 25% each instead of 10, or increasing the chance to draw a Moon card by 10%, while reducing Knight and Gem by 5, and making a Moon stack only require 3 instead of 5, or increasing the chance to draw Gem by 10%, while reducing Knight and Moon and increasing gem stacks to 7.5% each instead of 5. She's a sprinkle of complicated and random, but does it all pay off? Eh, not as much as you'd want, but she's not bad. She's a decent buffer and decent gold find, and she's worth keeping in your party to try to get those gem stacks for when you meet your wall. I think she sits in a low B. Next up is Havilar, the chaotic good tiefling fighter. She serves as tank, support, and speed, and if you've been hanging around for this series, you know her name has come up before. She's the twin sister of Farida in Seed 7, an adopted daughter of Mahen in Seed 3, and has minor synergies with both of them. Look into those seats to hear more about those. Here we'll mostly just be going over her kit. To start with, she unlocks her ultimate with her first upgrade level, which in the past required activation before summoning two imps. But now when she unlocks it, she will automatically summon the two imps, one named Mott, and another from a pool of three other imps, Dembo, Ola, and Bosch. While both imps are summoned, her ultimate turns into Heroic Sacrifice, which will send one of the imps, specifically the one that is not named Mott, to explode in a large AoE. Then the ultimate will change back to Summon Imps, which will resummon two imps, then rinse repeat. Each explosion slows the movement speed of all enemies hit, permanently, and this slow stacks so eventually you will be able to completely stop enemies in their tracks. 
This is incredibly useful not only for basic crowd control, but also for setting up an Azaka farm. This ultimate is quite unique to top it off, in that the cooldown is incredibly low. And because of that, Havilar does not have an equipment slot tied to ultimate cooldown, opening up one of those slots to increase her buffing potential even more. And since it has such a short cooldown, it is an excellent source of AoE bud damage. But most of the time, you'll want to summon them and leave them out, as each of the four imps affect two of Havilar's formation abilities in various ways. The first formation ability affected by the imps is Leadership Summit, where Havilar increases the damage of champions in the two columns behind her. If Mott is summoned, this will be increased by 400% on tiefling champions. Dembo flat increases the effect by 200%, Ola increases it by 50% for each enemy attacking Havilar, and Bosch increases the effect by 400% if there are Enraged stacks active. Her second formation ability affected by the imps is Fiendish Resolve, where if a fiend enemy is in the area, and no, her summoned imps do not count, she will focus on increasing leadership summit by 100% at the cost of doubling her attack cooldown. If Mott is active, he will further increase leadership summit by 25% per fiend enemy in the area. Dembo causes fiends that are killed, or items dropped by them, in the area to count for double quest progress. Ola will make fiends take 100% more damage from ultimate attacks, and Bosch will half the damage Havilar takes from all attacks, and will triple the damage of heroic sacrifice. She also gets Battlemaster, where each time she attacks, she will increase the damage of all champions in your formation, based on how many enemies she cleaved with her primary attack capping at 20 additive stacks. The buff is short-lived, lasting for half of her base attack cooldown, but is constantly being reapplied as she attacks. Her specialization choices are between reducing the cooldown of her ultimate even further, making it damn near spammable, and increasing the effect of Battlemaster by 100%. Generally, you'll want to take the Battlemaster increase, but if you plan to use her for bud bursts or stopping enemies in their tracks, you'll take the cooldown reduction. She's not the tankiest tank like Tyrell in bear form, but she massively outperforms his damage buffing potential, though it isn't anything super crazy. With a tiny bit of speed versus fiends, the slowing to full stop potential of her quick cooldown ultimate, and her synergy with her sister, by the way I forgot to mention, leadership summit is increased by 200% if her sister Farida is in the formation. And the fact that her pappy Mahen can bring her into any variant with his specialization makes her availability much better if you own both of them, as Mahen himself is available for every patron. She's not bad. In fact, I think she rides the line of high B to low A, and I think I'm pushing her into low A. But that's a pretty low A. Well, here we are. Rosie, the chaotic good halfling monk. The exclusively DPS grandma with low availability and some of the worst DPS output in the game. She has a tiny bit of utility, but let's just quickly break her down. To start with, she gets Sassy, where her damage is increased for each champion younger than her active in the formation. As she is 110, there is a fair amount of champions who qualify for this. She also gains Busy Bee Stinger, where she attacks faster and for more damage for each C-Team champion slotted in your formation, which includes Kithris, Donner, and Walnut. And with Shadow Arts, every fourth attack of hers is a whirlwind of AoE damage, dealing 100% increased damage. Now, the only thing of note with Rosie is Deflect Missile. She will deflect ranged and magic attacks targeting her or adjacent champions every 2.5 seconds. This is also tied to her ultimate, where she will root all enemies on screen and strike up to 10 enemies, but then she maintains deflection for 15 seconds. There are a few scenarios where this can be handy, but it doesn't come anywhere near saving her. Her specializations are between increasing her sassy even further by 100% for every female champion slotted that is younger than her, or flat increasing shadow arts by 300%. Without wasting more time here, I'm going to slide her right where she belongs in a hard F tier. Now make way for the buffest character in the game, Torogar the Lawful Evil Minotaur Barbarian. He serves as DPS and support, though really you'll only be using him as a support, because he has one glaring issue if you want to use him as a DPS. To start with, Torgar gains a stack tracking buff that persists through his entire lifetime in all adventures, in Markings of a Zealot. 
where when he or an adjacent champion kills an enemy, he will gain a zealot stack. Torgar's damage is increased by a small amount per stack additively. To pair with this, he also gains Breach, where he increases the damage of all other evil champions by a larger amount per zealot stack, also stacking additively. And this is where I say, <laughs> what the hell? Why doesn't Torgar get Breach? Why doesn't Torgar get Breach? Why doesn't Torgar get Breach? Why is it only other champions? That's like Birdsong's Song of Battle not affecting her, or Cridal not getting from the shadows, or Jahira not buffing herself with class warfare, Jim not getting magic, 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 or Zorbu not getting Hunter's back. I just don't get it. I can see an argument for saying it's redundant for him to scale with his zealot stacks twice. Okay, fine. But then let him scale with Preach instead, and just have markings of the zealot be how he tracks the stacks. Let's use my current scaling for example. Markings of a Zealot scales his damage additively for 7.631%. Let's just say 8% per stack. And Preach would scale it 81,300% per stack. A bit of a difference, eh? Why does he get so much less from his own kit? I hate it. Anyway, he also gains Blood Rage, where when his stacks reach a multiple of 50, he enters a Blood Rage for a short time. During this time, if he doesn't kill an enemy, he also debuffs them, adding a mark of Tiamat to them, increasing the damage they take from all champions by 300%. Depending on how many Zealot stacks you've accrued, you will add additional benefits to Blood Rage as follows. 250 adds a 2 second stun to marking an enemy. 2500 adds a small AoE for 50% of Torgar's damage when he attacks. At 25,000, enemies debuffed by Torgar attack slower. 250,000 will make Torgar attack faster. 2,500,000 increases the damage bonus from Mark of Tiamat by 200% multiplicatively. Now, he also gets Dark Order Synergy, but if you remember from the Seat 6 video, it's a whack affiliation. Preach will be increased by 100% for each Dark Order member, Arkin and Krull. He is adjacent to. This is so damn clunky though. Using Krull and Torgar together with Arkin, like the affiliation would suggest, just doesn't really work out since Arkin needs positional formation abilities, which Krull and Torgar both offer none. I don't know man, it's wild out there. Torgar does find a good fit with Krond and Artemis however, as they are both evil. He has a whopping 23 strength and is evil himself, so he really fits within the niche of Krond's survival of the fittest. And while he doesn't have a positional formation ability for Artemis to observe, he is a DPS to take in other positional formation abilities for him to scale, while Artemis can at least also benefit from Preach. His ultimate makes him rush through the battlefield to a random distant enemy, leaving behind a trail of fire that damages enemies that stand in it. And his specializations are a simple choice of making him gain a zealot stack when any evil champion gets a kill, or increasing the duration of Blood Rage by 15 seconds, and making his ultimate also cause him to go into a Blood Rage, making it easier to more reliably keep it active. He's definitely a bit restrictive, but he offers enough to those that can use him. I think he squeezes into a low B, maybe dipping into the C++. Time for our next evergreen champion, Ulcoria, the neutral good dwarf wizard. She serves only as support, which is done primarily through Spellcaster School, which gains a stack of the same name for every champion in your formation slotted with a magical base attack. This stack is applied multiplicatively to the already decent damage buff it offers, but only to those of that type, i.e. those with a magical attack. These stacks are also tracked with Watchful Order, which gains new buffs depending on how many stacks you're at. And remember, only those under the effect of Spellcaster School will receive these buffs. At 3, champions will attack faster. At 5, she increases the effect of positional formation abilities, scaling with each stack. At 7, champions have a chance to immediately attack again after attacking. And at 9, the base value of Spellcaster School is increased by 200%. Now sure, it's great if you can get to 9 but having a cohesive formation with 9 spellcasters can be a bit rough to achieve, especially if you're under any restrictions. Make your goal a minimum of 5 if you're looking to use her. She also gets a nice little minor boost with Defender of Waterdeep, where if you're running an adventure in the Waterdeep Dragon Heist campaign, 
She will increase your damage by an additional smaller amount. A fairly nice example of how to do a formation ability like this. It's a nice little boost, but it doesn't make or break her kit if you're not running an adventure there. Her specialization choice is actually choosing her ultimate attack. Between summoning a thick boy to stand back and launch lightning bolts equal to how many stacks she's at, or summon a bunch of little urchins to throw stuff at enemies, knocking them back, then stunning them, then slowing them. She's fairly simple all things considered, and very effective within her niche. But that's part of her problem. She's either like high A tier best in seat for magical primary attack DPS, or completely worthless for non-magic primary attack DPS. Even considering that, I'd say she's high B for the overall health of the game. With that caveat of if you are using a magical primary attacking DPS, get her in your formation with at least 5 stacks, yo. Y'all ready to be disappointed by the final member of the Companions of the Hall? I sure am. Let's all say hi to Wolfgar, the chaotic good human barbarian. Hi Wolfgar. His primary attack cleaves and has a 20% chance to stun enemies hit for 5 seconds. With his formation ability, Clan Geddon's Will, if he stuns 3 plus enemies with his attack, he will increase the damage of your formation for each stunned enemy, maintaining that for 15 seconds. Multiple applications can additively stack, but are all on their own 15 second timer. With Duma Thoin's Will, if he stuns a boss, he gains a beefy temporary hit point shield. With Moradin's Will, he increases the damage of all Companions of the Hall for each enemy attacking him. Why this is restricted to Companions of the Hall is beyond me, because this holds him back so much from being used elsewhere, as rarely you'll be focusing on Catibri or Drizzt being your primary damage dealer. And as a Companion of the Hall, he increases their pool of gold find, but also increases his chance to stun by 5% for every companion actively slotted in your formation with Empowered Warhammer. And finally with Smash and Grab, when he lands a hit on an armor-based enemy and doesn't remove an armor chunk, he increases the damage of all champions by 800%. His specializations are a choice between increasing his chance to stun by 10% or gaining an additional 20% chance to stun bosses and making Clan Geddon's will trigger off stunning a boss, not just 3 plus enemies, with an additional 4 times effectiveness for stunning a boss. Clearly the second is the breadwinner if you plan on taking on bosses. And with his ultimate he throws his hammer at the farthest enemy, stunning all enemies in its path. Now overall his kit sounds solid, decent crowd control, a handful of buffs, and some temp HP for tanking. The problem is, without using companions, he just completely falls off when compared to any other tank or anyone else in this seat, well, other than Rosie. So with that in mind, he's going to fall into the F+, so he can be better than Rosie. Now if you happen to use Drist or Catibri as your DPS, he's not bad, but personally I just can't recommend someone going out of their way to unlock him. But if Morden's Will ever turns into all champions instead of just companions, we'll be singing a completely different tune around here. I'm looking at you, future seasons. Lastly, we have Jorvan, the chaotic neutral, Harangon barbarian slash druid. He serves as a DPS and support, with debuffs and damage negation. The first thing to know with Jorvan is his primary attack, Ferocious Maul, where he leaps out at an enemy and latches onto them for five seconds, dealing damage each second. His first formation ability, Blood Fury Tattoo, makes each hit of Ferocious Maul debuff the enemy for 2 seconds, making them take more damage from all sources. Each hit will refresh that duration and give a new stack. Jorvan also debuffs enemies he's already hit with Infectious Fury, making them take more damage from all champions when that enemy is attacking the formation. For his damage negation he gets Danger Sense making champions adjacent to Jorvan take less damage from all attacks, and giving Jorvan a damage buff when the ability lowers damage from an attack. In late runs this will never really be a lifesaver, but it does have a feat to increase the amount a bit, but mm, that's the only way you can scale it. However, since it's a positional formation ability, if you place Jorvan next to a bunch of other DPS so Artie can observe it, you can effectively make Artemis a tank as he shrugs off a very large amount of damage. His specializations are between him attacking instantly if he lands a killing blow with Ferocious Maul, or causing his Ferocious Maul to lash out Eldritch Energy at a secondary target, dealing damage based on the amount of health Jorvan's target currently has, capped out by your bud damage. Eh, 
and generally the second is the more useful pick. And his ultimate causes him to morph into Nightmare Fuel, where his attack cooldown is reduced by 2.5 seconds, and his damage is increased by 400% for 30 seconds. The overall problem with Yorvin is his numbers are quite low. However, another positive is that since he's a debuffer, he's not bad for a click debuff formation. But even then, he's a tad clunky, as it requires you to specifically click the enemies he's actively attacking, or have enemies actively attacking your formation that he's already attacked. I think he falls down to a healthy C because of his numbers. He has some utility, and he's fun to mess around with, and I actually love his design. But there we have it. Seat 10 has been tiered. Don't forget to hit the like, sub, and bell. Leave a comment on what you think about these champions, or what you think about the new season feature, eh? Looks like I'll have to work up something to go over the changes that have come to the era with Synergy, even though I've yet to cover one of their members. Have a hell of a time out there, Tyrodactyls.